All right, this is John Kolo with OKRaw.com. Today we have another exciting episode for you. And you know, just yesterday I was actually at the fermentation festival in Petaluma, California, the Sonoma County Fermentation Festival. It was an amazing time. You guys should have been there. Um, if you guys missed it, be sure to check my uh, video on my other channel, Growing Your Greens. I'll put a link down below if I remember uh, to my video on that. And when I was at the fermentation festival, I only got the time to go to like maybe two and a half <laughs> lectures while I was there. And Alex was one of the speakers that I went to hear and I was super impressed. So actually I caught up with him afterwards and got his contact info and now I'm interviewing him uh, about some of the things that he taught me actually at the presentation. He's a author of two fermentation books here. Uh, this one came out like five years ago. It's on basically like fermenting vegetables for the most part and other things, of course. But uh, his new book that was literally just released, you know, this is probably the first interview that you're going to see online about it, um, like two days ago, is right here. And this is an amazing book. It's uh, Kombucha Kiefer and Beyond, uh, some really easy and simple fermented beverages you guys could make at home. And that's why I wanted to have him on the show today because I strongly believe in the power of fermented vegetables um, and, and fermented drinks made with them and fruits as well. And getting away from all these processed sugar drinks. I mean, you gotta drink something, you know? Hopefully you're drinking at least clean, filtered water. You know, I like to drink vegetable juices. Those are some of my favorite things because it's basically purified water by the plant, right? It's, and plus it comes along with a whole package of other nutrients and vitamins and antioxidants and all this stuff. But the fact of the matter is, unfortunately, most people are still drinking sugary soda and other beverages that are not serving your health. And so today in this episode, we're gonna interview Alex and uh, show you guys some of the recipes out of the book and why, more importantly, you guys should make some fermented beverages instead of just drinking even just a plain water. How simply with just something like beets and water, you can make an amazing fermented beverage that now makes that water better and allows you to get some of the beta lanes from the beets. All right, Alex, so I wanna ask you the first question is, um, why are fermented beverages so important for people to consume? Well, John, there are a lot of reasons, I mean, First of all, like you said, it's a good way to get more fruits and vegetables, period, um, because generally the things you're fermenting are, a lot of them are going to be fruits and vegetables. Um, um, second of all, fermentation eats some of the sugar in the drinks, so you get less sugar and all of the stuff that was sugar gets turned into organic acids and there are all sorts of trace things and um, as a result of the fermentation, I should say, if there's anyone who doesn't know what fermentation is, it's the action of microbes on your food. So it's microbes pre-digesting your food for you. And they do good things when they pre-digest your food. They, as a byproduct of their digesting your food, they create B, C vitamins, sometimes A, D, K vitamins. And so the, a fermented vegetable juice actually has more vitamins in it than a raw vegetable juice, which is, interesting and more enzymes because uh, microbes use enzymes the same way we do to digest things and anything we can do to get more vitamins and more enzymes and to to have the minerals easier to access in our foods is going to be good for us so those are some of the advantages of fermented drinks also i think drinks like everyone drinks things and so fermented drinks are easy to substitute into anyone's life who doesn't eat, uh, who doesn't drink fermented drinks, they just drink something. And so why not drink something fermented while you're there? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I think drinking a fermented drink is a lot easier than like, kind of like trying to add sauerkraut or kimchi onto your food or getting somebody else like your husband, wife, boyfriend or girlfriend who's maybe not eating as healthy as you guys are, you know, <laughs> to eat it when they're already gonna drink some, oh, you're here, drink this red stuff. And it <laughs> tastes pretty good, right? And, and it's good for them and it's getting the beneficial probiotics and the bacteria. So you talked about the microbes and I know a lot of people out there are scared of microbes, man. If I make this, am I going to get E. coli and am I going to get <laughs> sick and all this kind of stuff? <laughs> so, right. So microbes, like the human body, 
most of the cells inside of your body within the confines, the boundaries of your body are microbes. Where I, you know, you hear different numbers. One number I heard was 90% of the cells inside of you are, are microbes and 99% of the unique genetic material inside of you is microbe DNA. And so like we have this thing where we're afraid of germs and it started with Louis Pasteur and you know, he discovered germs and then in some contexts there's good reasons to kill germs, right? Like if you have an infection or something, right? But now we think like, oh, well, if sometimes it's good to kill germs, then maybe we should kill all the germs all the time. And that is wrong because 90% of what's going on in our body is germs. And so if we start killing them indiscriminately, we'll kill a bunch of them and then like the other ones will take over and then there'll be some foreign ones that make it in. Like you get like candida yeast will take over if, if you don't have the bacteria that are supposed to be there. And so you kick thing, this delicate ecosystem that's your body and you kick it out of balance and then all sorts of things go wrong with, you know, parasites and with your immune system getting messed up. And so like, yes, the germs are our friends and we want to fortify the, the ones, the, the, the balance that's maintained in our body and uh, rather than like killing. You know, I say, I say, so when you're canning food, you actually do want to kill all the microbes because if you kill all of them except one, then you're going to have a can with one microbe and nothing to hold it back. And it's going to be really pissed off and it's going to eat everything and multiply. And then like, if it's the wrong microbe, then you'll open it and you'll eat it and you'll die. Um, fermentation is more about uh, diplomacy and less about massacre. Um, you're creating conditions where the microbes that uh, are going to help you will take root and they'll just crowd out all the other ones. Um, so for anyone who's worried about fermentation, it's really a lot safer than um, not fermenting actually. Yeah, make love, not war, or peace, <laughs> not war with the microbes, right? Instead of like trying to kill them all, that's like the war, be peace with them and like cultivate them, right? And you know, if you do it in a proper way, right, you're going to cultivate the good ones and uh, they're going to hang out with you. I mean, one of the things I do is I don't use an antibacterial, you know, soap or anything. I use actually a probiotic soap. So I'm putting good microbes and spreading them on my body. So you want to talk about antimicrobial soaps and hand sanitizers that people maybe use in Alex because I know we kind of have a similar opinion on this. Oh, yeah. And so, so, uh, so for example, or the water, you know, the water that we get from the municipal water supply has chlorine in it. And why does it have chlorine in it? To kill microbes. And for transporting water, that's perhaps appropriate. You don't want microbes, you know, all over the place. And if you have to drink it without filtering it in a pinch, you know, it's okay. But if you're doing things that specifically want to cultivate microbes, then you need to try to get the chlorine out of there because it's in there to kill microbes and to stop microbes from growing. So filter your water. And if you use antimicrobial soap on your hands or antimicrobial dishwashing liquid or any of that, it's going to work against you when you're fermenting. And in fact, it's going to work against you if you're just trying to live because again, it'll throw you off balance. But um, so the whole, the war on microbes is like, you know, most things, most wars that are declared on abstract <laughs> invisible things, you know, are not actually going to work very well. This is one of those. So, you know, like John said, make, make love, learn to, you know, coexist peacefully with them and, and benefit from them rather than trying to kill them all and then just killing some of them, then you have a bigger problem. Right. Yeah. I mean, in nature, nature is self-balancing, right? There's always a way in nature, like I teach gardening, right? In, in gardening, there's all these healthy soil microbes and we want to foster the good ones and chemical farming is destroying all the microbes and it's messing up the whole planet. I mean, that's what people are doing with their bodies when they eat foods that don't nourish their microbes and make the microbes go the wrong direction. So you want to talk about maybe some of the foods beside that, that we just want to eat to get some of the, that will harbor good bacteria within us? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's another argument for eating organic fruits and vegetables rather than conventional ones. The, the organic ones uh, will have whatever natural microbes were on them. The conventional ones will have like antifungal sprays on them or, you know, all sorts of like, um, like Roundup and, and 
things like that. So Roundup is interesting. They, they've done studies in Petri dishes with Roundup and human cells and they say, oh, Roundup doesn't hurt human cells because Roundup is designed to disrupt this biochemical pathway that human cells don't have in them because humans aren't plants. Great, so it's safe. But the problem is it turns out that these biochemical pathways exist in the microbes in our bodies. So if Roundup isn't killing the human cells, there's still that other 90% of the cells in your body that might be messing up. So no pesticides, uh, no herbicides, no antifungals, um, to the extent that you can do it, you know, do the, do the best you can. But um, yeah, like feed your body as if you're feeding your plants. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I want to let you guys know that, you know, plants are what feeds the microbes. All the plant fibers, you know, feed the microbes, right? And these are, the, these are the microbes we want inside us, the ones from the plants. Like, we don't want animal microbes in us because those are the ones that are, you know, um, probably the bad microbes that are decaying like rotten flesh and stuff. But uh, anyways, I think the next thing I want to talk about was uh, what are some of the different things that, we, that you've made here and created here today? Oh yeah, good. So, so you saw my demo yesterday. So one of the things I made was uh, called Tepache. It's a pineapple wine. I was introduced to it by my co-author Raquel, um, and it's 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 a wonderful thing because you take all the parts of the pineapple that you aren't going to eat, like the core and the outside, the husk and all of that the skin, yeah, and you chop it up into little pieces and you add some sugar and put it all in a jar and add some spices maybe if you want. And um, if you can use dark sugar, that's better because the darker the sugar is, the more minerals. It's dark because it has minerals in it like iron and, and you know, other, other things. So you put in a jar and you screw a cap on with a coffee filter or a towel or something. And I don't know if you can see on the video, it's already foamy yeah. around the edges. And this, so this is one day and um, maybe it's better that way. It's already fermenting. If I shake it up a little, you know, there'll be more foam. Um, so it's already fermenting. It was exceptionally hot yesterday, but um, most places pineapples grow are pretty hot. So, um, so fast forward, it's like the cooking show where voila, it's done. And so this one is old. I don't even remember. I didn't have a date on it in my kitchen, but this has gone almost to dry and it's pretty strong. So, um, you know, well, we'll pour your, well, I'll pour you some. Yeah, but, pour me straight up. I'll try. Okay. So this is um, just, this is the pineapple, like, you know, you took out the core or the good part to eat, then you kind of left some of the fruit and the, the skin and everything, and then you just literally added water and, like, let this sit. Yeah. You don't know exactly how long this sits, but how long normally would somebody let this sit until they'd want to drink it? So the best way to do it, I think, is you let this sit like this for maybe a week, and then you put it into bottles and it'll still have some sugar left then, and then you cap the bottles, and then the carbon dioxide, when you have it like this, when it's open, the carbon dioxide can dissipate. Once you put it in the bottle, the carbon dioxide will build up and you'll get something fizzy. I didn't do that with this because it was still in a jar, and I, you know, I think it's like, it might be a year old or something. A year, so I'm yeah. drinking year old fermented pineapple rinds. <laughs> and I think it tastes like it. It has a sort of aged flavor to it, and it's super dry. Um, you know, you can, throw some sugar in and put it in a bottle. And the sugar is for the microbes, by the way. Like by the time it's done, there's very little sugar in it that you're going to be eating. And you can use like coconut sugar or, you know, whatever your favorite. Honey. Honey, you could use honey. You could or, use like if you, if you juiced actually the pineapple core or the pineapple that you were going to eat, but instead juiced it and used that for part of the sugar, would that work also? You could totally do that, yeah. And, you know, I'm sure they do that somewhere. I'm sure somewhere in the world they just take the whole pineapple and, and mash, it up mash and the whole yeah. thing, right? right. Uh, <laughs> and then they don't have to add any kind of white processed sugar or something. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, so, um, right, right cheers. <laughs> it's kind of strong, so. I'm good. I've tried yeah. all kinds of stuff. Wow, it's so it smells like some kind of alcoholic beverage. Am I going to get, like, drunk off this stuff? It's probably, <laughs> I'm going to say this is like 4 or 5%, maybe. Mmm. So is this legal to make your own alcohol at home? Uh, you can make it. I'm not sure about <laughs> selling it. I think you may need some kind of permit to sell it. So if, if, you, if you're somebody like, I don't normally drink, but I mean, it's right. a special occasion. But if you want to make sure that it did not go alcoholic on you, like how could you do that? Um, pineapple wine will probably go alcoholic. <laughs> um, beets, you can go, you can make beet wine or you can make, you know, sour beets. And this one will have like, 
no alcohol in it. I have not experimented with making non-alcoholic. You can make like a pineapple chutney. If you use, if you use a sour bacterial starter or if you, yeah, I think you would, you would want to use some kind of starter or something like that. You can make a pineapple chutney that did not go alcoholic, just went sour. And the other thing is, if you leave this exposed to air for long enough, like any alcoholic drink, it'll turn to vinegar, and then you have oh, nice so pineapple, you have vinegar. pineapple vinegar. So that'd be another, that'd be actually a good thing to do if you didn't want to drink, you just like expose it to air and let yeah. it sit, and then have your own pineapple vinegar out of the parts of the pineapple you would have thrown away. Yeah, totally. And then you can use that in your coleslaw or for, you know, for, yes, marinating for salad, whatever, or whatever, yeah. Right. Yeah. So just to be sure, like, the sugar is totally burned off, yeah, I don't, taste, I don't taste any yeah, sugar. Yeah, no, I don't taste any sugar either. Yeah. I mean, it's not really even sweet. No, it's not. <laughs> I mean, I'd no. rather drink pineapple juice, but right. so what are the specific benefits I'm getting from drinking this fermented skin and pineapple and all that stuff? Yeah, so, you know, whatever, whatever nutrients are in the pineapple are going to be, you know, a lot of them are going to come out in the liquid along with the, the yeast, so you know, I said as a byproduct of the metabolism of these microbes, they create B and C vitamins, like yeast in particular, a lot of vitamin B, the dead yeast cells that, that sort of settle to the bottom here have a lot of vitamin B and some protein because they're cells. Um, and so in, certainly in the past, um, people have gotten meaningful amounts of protein from the yeast that's, that winds up in their beer and their bed because of the you know the yeast so i'm going to say there's some some protein some b and c vitamins and then whatever other nutrients are in the pineapple that you would have not gotten i mean you would have composted it i guess so it's pretty acidic to i don't even know no, no you right? could compost yeah. it fully yeah, okay. do it all the time you can still compost it even once you're done exactly, with this right yeah so and the other thing is you're gonna you know maybe if you macerate the skin up you're gonna get some of the nutrients near or on the skin that most people don't ever get in their diets yeah yeah so and let's talk about the probiotics or so what are some of the beneficial microbes besides just the nutrients in here you know like the yeah. protein and all that stuff but what what kind of microbes are in here do you know um you know i try not to um analyze too much because i don't know exactly what microbes my body needs and so and i also don't know what microbes are in here <laughs> and i don't have a spectrometer but i i do know that um People, people I know who go from not eating a lot of fermented foods to eating, you know, even a small but regular dose of fermented foods report much better digestion and um, in some cases immune system function. That one's a little harder to measure. Digestion is good because it's really easy to measure your digestion because you it happens every day and and you know between you know your elimination and between like a lot of people have acid reflux like we have a, a digestion uh epidemic in the country if, if you look at the ads on tv like so many of them are for digestion and then the rest are for diabetes and, and i'm not judging anyone or blaming anyone who who has a a, a, a sickness i i want to help you you know and and the number of people who I've talked to personally who have said, oh, I had acid reflux and then I started drinking kombucha and now it went away and I don't take the pills anymore. You know, you know, a couple of hands worth of people have, have told me that. And so like, I don't need to see any studies and I don't really care what microbes there are or whether it's the microbes or whether it's the acids in the kombucha or something else about it. Like, I don't know, it's, it's helping people. That's, that's the important part to me. And um, I think a lot of people get uh, analysis paralysis they say show me the science you know where are the studies and like y you know for things that are pretty clearly not going to kill you I think like you are the best judge of what works for you because what might work for one person might not work for another person anyway so like I don't know I don't know what's in it um, yeah <laughs> all right well that's a good honest answer here's the thing you know I mean I was researching like some at the health food store, you could go down and buy probiotic supplements, right? Most of them are bacterial based, but there's some yeast based ones too, actually, especially ones like if somebody has like candida, there's like the yeast supplement that actually is uh, good for you, you know, because there's good yeast and bad yeast. And once again, it's also good and bad, but it's also the balance of the yeast and the bacteria and what kinds and it, it gets pretty complex. But here's the thing that I learned researching one night is that off like uh, the skin of lychees, for example, right? There's this yeast that they basically pull off and they culture and then they sell you in little supplement tablets, right? 
and it's supposed to help people with candida. But it originally came from like lychee skin. So here's the thing, like how many of you guys eat lychee skin? Or maybe if you get fresh lychees that haven't been irradiated, right? And then you eat it, you get some, some of that yeast on your hand and you eat it and then you get it. But what if you took the lychee skin and the lychee and just did something like this to it, right? And now you're getting some of the, you know, the yeast and the bacteria that would live on the, on the pineapple in the field and you're basically cultivate, cultivating them, increasing the numbers, and then you're just taking them in a drink like this. Yeah. And what potential health benefits could there be? I guess um, on the flip side, you gotta look at what are the potential harmful things that could happen. So, you know, talking about the pineapple, you're um, using the skin and all, and hopefully this is an organic pineapple. It was an organic pineapple, because, yeah. Because uh, with uh, conventional pineapples, you know, they do put fungicides and they spray pesticides on there. So do you wanna maybe give a few words about that? Yeah, I mean, any of these things where you're concentrating the, the essence of these fruits and vegetables, you wanna use clean fruits and vegetables. And, um, you know, fungicides are there specifically to Im inhibit yeast and mold from growing, but, uh, you know, just, you know, you're better getting organic things. I mean, I don't know, I don't know what, what more to say. You don't want to concentrate all the, all the poisons that they put on there to inhibit uh, the yeast and molds. And also your ferments aren't going to work as well. So, yeah, the so, organic stuff. Or grow it yourself, even yeah, better. Even right? better. But, so the thing I'd say is like, what if somebody could, if they can't find organic pineapple, either they get a non-organic pineapple, maybe you could scrub it really well, use some kind of like sprays to spray off the stuff and get as much stuff up as you can, or not do it at all. Like, you think it's better to do it with a conventional pineapple or not do it? Because what I like to preach is good, better, best. We, we can't always live in this utopian society where we get organic stuff, or you could always grow your own. You know, I even buy my organic pineapples, and sometimes I get non-organic, because actually it's on, you know, the clean 15 list sometimes. So what would you say to that? I would say do it anyway. And I would also say like try and do a wide variety of yeah. stuff. Like don't get fixated on just like this one thing, like get a variety of ferments into your diet. And like, you know, I know some people love kombucha, but you know, do you really want to drink like six bottles of kombucha a day? I, you know, maybe not actually, you know, the, the digestively, you know, I've heard different things, but I've heard like too much acidic drink, like in excess, excess is actually bad for your teeth. Oh, yeah. So uh, like, you know, don't, there isn't any one thing that's going to solve all your problems. And so I guess keep, keep some proportion. And if you do that and like you get one conventional pineapple one day, um, you know, it's, it's not the end of the world. And I think like on the good, better, best, or don't do it at all. I think like a non-conventional pineapple, or sorry, conventional pineapple, not organic pineapple, would be good. It's still worth doing. Yeah, I mean, of course, let's put things in focus here, like a non, a conventional pineapple and drinking this uh, stuff that he made here versus like a soda, right? Right. This stuff's still way better, man. Right. Because the coffee or the soda or whatever, still probably just way processed and just crap, right? So good, better, best, you know? And once again, like he says, I really would agree with, you know, do pineapple once in a while, you know, don't like drink this stuff every day. You have it like, you know, once, once a month easily, twice a month maybe, right? But mix it up and do other fruits. So you've done pineapple here. Yeah. Um, and have they, in, in traditional cultures, they've done this, right? Do you want to talk a bit more about the traditional use of the pineapple? Sure. I mean, I, I think um, in most places they have pineapples, they, they, you know, do something with the husk, they ferment it or it'll ferment on its own if you put it all in a pile. Um, it turns out that somewhere in the, uh, before we were human, um, and maybe even before we were monkeys, uh, animals developed this ability to smell uh, rotting fruit, and it helped evolutionarily, uh, it helped creatures find new food sources, and uh, we still have that uh, ability to smell it and the taste for it. And so it's a food source where there might not have been a food source before. And, uh, you know, people I've talked to in, from different pineapple, like I was talking to my college roommate who's from Guyana, one of my college roommates, and um, I was, I sent him a link to my, uh, to our uh, tipache recipe. And he said, oh yeah, they make that in Guyana too. I'm like, okay, 
they probably make it everywhere and there's probably like 500 different names for it. Um, and that's true of a lot of traditional foods and drinks. Actually also they don't have like a brand, like Tepache isn't a brand, it's not like Coca-Cola, it's the Tepache TM, no. It's, it's, it's a, a class of traditional uh, foods that people have made for hundreds, maybe thousands of years, so. Yeah, and for many reasons, you know, I mean, back in the day, they didn't even, I mean, we're, we take for granted having clean water without, like, you know, bad bacteria in there, mm. right? In the olden days, they would make ferments because it would literally purify the water, like the bacteria, the good bacteria will kick ass out of the bad bacteria, so you can actually drink it. I mean, the other thing is, in the olden days, they didn't want to waste any food. Food was a scarcity. I mean, unfortunately, now we have all these supermarkets just on the corner, and you could buy whatever you want, so they would use every last bit of whatever they had plus maybe you know because this is can be an alcoholic you know feels a little bit nice <laughs> right no you, you raise a good point i mean historically uh you know once we started moving into cities and once we started having domesticated animals like the water supply uh you know went went bad and we started having infectious diseases and you know we didn't understand sanitation and so we've had to think about how we could purify our water and uh, small amounts of alcohol or acidity have been great ways to do that. And what do you know, that's what fermented drinks are. Um, so in ancient Greece, you know, they drank a lot of wine, but it turns out most of the time they had wine heavily diluted with water. And so it's not necessarily because they liked their wine diluted with water, it's because they had to drink all day. And if they drank full strength wine all day, they'd fall over. And so they had wine just to purify their water. And like sometimes the wine turned to vinegar and turns out you can put vinegar in water and that'll purify the water too. And they, you know, ancient Greece, ancient Rome, pretty much everywhere they've had grapes, they've had some kind of watery, somewhat alcoholic grape based uh, vinegar or alcohol thing. And, um, you know, and you wonder why they drink so much beer in England and like industrial revolution London, the water was really bad and you couldn't drink the water, right? So you have to drink something, you know, colonial America in the cities, uh, you know, a lot of hard apple cider and, uh, you know, water was not we take water for granted it's not something we've always had yeah and it's i think it's kind of going away myself <laughs> like good water but that's another topic for another day so um you've made this today out of the pineapples but what other fruits can you actually do this uh, same thing with um well you can make wine out of out of grapes um, so this is a similar way you take the wine skins and just put it in water and just let it sit yeah, I mean, people make it different ways. Usually if you're making uh, grape wine, you'll just crush up the wine skins um, and you'll just rely on the juice from them and you'll leave the skins in for a longer, shorter length of time with the liquid that you've gotten, depending on the characteristics you want the wine to have. Um, we intentionally avoided talking about grape wines in our book because there are so many people who do that so well that, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm strategic about how I spend my time at home and making grape wine doesn't seem to be the best use of my time because I can, you know, for uh, some small amount of money, I can buy a bottle of actually pretty good, pretty cleanly produced wine. Um, and it's way easier than making it. And uh, whereas with pineapple, I have the outside of the pineapple anyway, because I just ate the pineapple. Um, I don't have, like we have a pretty clear idea of how we want our grape wine to taste. I have a much broader acceptable target for pineapple wine. And so I won't say, oh, this doesn't taste like pineapple wine. You know, it, if it turns out different every time, I actually view that as being a feature rather than a bug. Um, so you can do it with grapes. Hard apple cider is another good one. Um, some of these things make a little more sense if you already have the ingredient. Like I don't grow pineapples, but I know people in a lot of places grow pineapples. But I know people who have apples because apples grow in, in more temperate climates. And so if you have a huge ton of apples, you can't eat all of them. And most apples are too sour to eat anyway. So what can you do with them? You can make hard apple cider or just, you know, slightly hard apple cider too. It's a continuum. You can make like 1% apple cider that everyone can drink. Um, you, you know, I think alcohol 
and this is a whole other topic, but alcoholic beverages have gotten a bad name because we want this like 16% red wine and this 12% this heroic beer and you know these distilled alcohols and I think uh, that's where the problems start. Um, you know the alcohol that people drank a long time ago, uh, three four percent, you could um, it, it caused a lot of fewer problems. And the other thing is until it's only in the last hundred years that we've been we've had this need to be sober enough to pilot these two-ton steel fortresses around. And it's really not a natural thing for humans to do. Our nervous systems aren't suited to being in constant fight or flight vigilance for like an hour at a time and like sitting still and not moving around. You know, it's really not a good thing for humans to do. And when you combine it with, you know, 16% wines or 40% liquors, it's, it's, you know, it's bad deadly. news. Yeah. It's really deadly. Yeah. All right. Uh, so moving on uh, from the pineapple wine, which is totally amazing. And so the last question I have actually, how can somebody tell if this has gone bad? Like if they shouldn't mm. drink it? Cause I mean, I drank this for the first time today. I've never had this before. And it's like, all right, it tasted kind of interesting. Like yeah. I don't know that it would necessarily, it didn't taste like pineapple juice and it tastes kind of fermented, not like vinegar, but I so it was kind of, I liked it. It was kind of in between, but how can somebody know if they made a good one or not? So the nice thing about fermented drinks is if something goes wrong, it goes really wrong <laughs> and there'll be like fuzzy mold everywhere on everything. And if that doesn't happen, then it means that whatever you're making got either acidic enough or alcoholic enough quickly enough that the bad stuff isn't coming. Um, it's different from canning where it can be deadly without having any visible problems with with fermenting there's always something very visibly wrong um, and it happens pretty quickly if it's going to happen so you know you'll definitely get like funky smells and like some a little bit of barnyard and some yeastiness and and sourness and that's normal um, and that may take some getting used to but um, if you open it and it's gone wrong, you'll, you'll know you don't need any, any serious training for that. So. And so in your book, you explain like some of the things that could happen and what to look out for, right? More in detail. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, most of it, you can, some of it you can even correct. Like if you start seeing a little bit of, um, yeast forming on the surface of something, you know, if there's things poking up above the liquid, like with, with these, liquid ferments usually you want things to be under the liquid and if they're poking up you know you can depending on what it is you can open it up and push them back down or you can there there are things you can do to to correct the situation before it becomes an actual problem and and you know there are different things like you'll notice this one is open to the air uh because it's a coffee filter so it gets some air whereas other things will make like um like this beet kvass doesn't need to be open to the air. Um, there are things you can do with temperature, access to air. And that's um, all in your book though, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. So, so let's move on. So this is simply just beets and water. So you can make your water, oh beets, water and salt. You can yeah. make your beets and, and water even better. So what did you do here and what does it create? Yeah. So this is a tablespoon of salt, two beets, cut into eh, three quarter inch cubes, but it's precision is not important. Um, and then water. And uh, I did this yesterday morning and it was really warm yesterday. And so already you have this foam here that you can see pretty easily and that's fermentation happening. So that's the sugars and starches in the beets being converted to acid. Um, and so let's see if we can get did you hear that yeah, little, I heard a yeah. little right so carbon dioxide is is part of what's what's is part of that transformation and that's what's making the bubbles um, and that's what made the noise when I burped it just now um, so what we'll get at the end of it I can yeah voila <laughs> um, so it's a lot darker right how long has this been sitting just to compare the two you guys yeah. see the difference in color so this says June 14th on it um, so here's another thing when you're fermenting is like blue tape and Sharpies are your friend because you want to know 
when it, and if you share a room with somebody or a house or something, y you know, you want to label it because so, otherwise they're going to be like, what the heck is this? And like, is it bad? Right? So at least if they see your handwriting on it, they're going to ask you before they throw it out. So. And so this is the beat kvass. So this is made like what in, in Russia? They've, they've made this traditionally for a long time, right? Indeed. Yeah. Beat kvass, like kvass, they have different kinds of kvass, like bread kvass. If you just say kvass, then it means bread kvass. And so everyone says beet kvass, but m more people in the U.S. I find are interested in beet kvass or you can make carrot kvass. Like bread kvass is, is a little weird to our palates. Well, a lot of this stuff is, I guess. From a health point of view, beet kvass, I think, is a winner. But I find that um, red beets uh, work better than golden beets or striped beets or any of that. And so you, you beet salt water, and then after a couple of weeks or more, you have this liquid, which is very good for you. You have the beets, which are very probiotic and you can eat them or you can juice them or you can blend them and make a dressing out of them or marinate or you know if you get too many of them you can compost them too or you know whatever you need to do with them cool um, so what are some of the benefits of the kvass here so uh, you know you'll notice patterns all the benefits of the beets plus the benefits of 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 the microbes, so B and C vitamins, and then you get from the beets, I mean, you get what, iron, the beta magnesium. Lanes, yeah. You know, the deep rich pigments, really good for you. So, um, so now, yeah, actually, it's another way to eat beets. And how many of you guys have eaten beets lately, right? Probably not so many, but now you're getting all the basically the beet beets extracted into the water that, that taste amazing right yeah and you know i'm not a huge fan of like cooked beets they're kind of sweet and like i don't i'm not a huge fan of cooked beets but but in this form um i i i really like them or like sour beets i think suit me better and you know you can blend the beets up you can make it into a cold soup you can make it into a hot soup although if you get it above 117 degrees you start killing off you know enzymes and it's not raw anymore but like for a cold summer soup, you could make, make a base for a gazpacho or something like that with or without blending the beets up. Cool. Well, hey, let's try it. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> okay. Do you need a rinse or are you good? No, I'm good. I pretty much okay. drank all that last step. Yeah. Okay. So this has been literally sitting for since it was made, right? Sealed yeah. in the jar or have you been opening it up or you burp it or how does that work? Um, I had forgotten about it, so I, I definitely haven't done anything to it for at least a month. Um, so literally, it's just been sitting just the beets in water and just chopped up beets, water, and salt, and you just yeah. tap it off and just let it sit in a, yeah. in a cool, dark place, right? Yeah, yeah, on my counter so that I don't completely forget about it. And uh, sometimes I put ginger in it, that can be nice oh, cool. too. Okay, this should have like zero alcohol. And if you, if you, um, it has a little fizz to it too, which is pretty nice. The more you open and shut the jar, the less fizz you have. Um, if you really like it fizzy, you can always cheat and just throw some sparkling water in it. That's actually um, quite good. So, I mean, I taste like beet essence, but like I've had straight beet juice and if you drink too much straight beet juice, I've actually thrown up <laughs> on straight beet juice. But this is like really watered down. It's kind of slightly effervescent. It's yeah. like a tad bit sweet. You could barely taste the sweetness, but it has a really good body. I mean, mm. you could go down to your local health food store and there's companies that make beet kvass. You could buy a bottle of it for like three bucks or look, some good filtered water, some organic beets chopped up, a little bit of salt. A month later, you're drinking some really good stuff and then you still got the beets to eat afterwards. Yeah, like two beets will get you a half gallon of this and it's got to be, you know, maybe five times cheaper than buying it. Maybe, you know, I don't more. Know. <laughs> no more, right. You know, but if you're on the road and like, you need something to drink and you see the kvass in the health store, you know, I, I'm not going to discourage anyone from buying it because it's probably one of the best. Good, better, you best. Can, you right? know, I mean, buying some beet kvass is probably better than getting some uh, bottled water in a plastic bottle because the beet kvass is at least in a glass <laughs> container. Yeah. But, but you're also getting the, the benefits of the beets. Totally. Like all these things are really good, you know, sports drinks. Well, I mean, I guess if you drink too much pineapple wine, you're going to be, <laughs> you know, listing a little to the side. But like, what does this have in it? It has salt. If you use good sea salt, you get like uh, good trace minerals. It has all the, you know, benefits from the beets. Um, you know, forget about Gatorade. Like this is, this is what you need 
if, on, if you're like sweating out all your minerals, you get them back this way, right? I mean. Yeah, so can you use other vegetables? Like you mentioned carrots, but could you use like celery, which is actually even better in electrolytes in some ways than. Uh... Absolutely, I mean, I, what I would say is, you know, when you're trying this, I would say maybe start with a beet base and then add some celery to it and see how that goes, or you have turnips or, or, or carrots. And, um, you know, the thing here is you have mostly the liquid, the brine, and then you add the pieces of vegetables. So just keep that pattern and vary the vegetables a little bit and see what, see what works for you, see what you like. Also adding like, you know, ginger is good. You can add some horseradish root or, um, you know, turmeric, you know, go crazy. And that's what I like about your recipe book. You know, it's a good starting place. And, you know, he has specific recipes on specific add this amount to this amount to this amount of water. But, you know, you guys, once you get going and you, you kind of know how to do it, you can kind of play with it a little bit. So you want to talk a little bit about that, Alex? Um, yeah, you know, my hope is not that, you know, anyone's going to take either of these books as like the Bible and, and say, oh, I must, you know, Master Alex says that this is the one true sauerkraut or the one true beet kvass and I must make it that way always. You know, I will be, you know, way happier if, you know, you start with that recipe and you say, oh, that's great. I wonder what would happen if I do this. Or, you know, even if you try like five of the recipes in there and say, you know, I really don't like that one. I really like this one. And then maybe you'll research it or you'll look around at how other people are making beet cross on the internet and you'll see somebody is putting, you know, horseradish in and you say, oh, I'm going to try that. Or, or maybe you'll think of your own things that you want to do. You know, I, I keep the recipes simple just to keep the bar pretty low so nobody's going to be like overwhelmed with ingredients or equipment. But, you know, maybe you will want to try something fancy and maybe you'll want to, you know, share it with other people. And, you know, that's cool. The more, the more people are doing this, the more, I think, uh, the better off humans are going to be. You know what I mean? So let's talk about the salt, because I know some people are salt sensitive and I don't generally like to eat extra added salt into my diet. Could this recipe done, be done without salt? And why is the salt in there? Mm. So it's a good question. The salt is in there to tip the balance of the microbes in favor of the ones that we like. Like if you think about a beet, if you just left a beet out on the counter, um, it would turn to a pile of mush after a while. And if you just put it under the liquid, it would... Um, it wouldn't turn to mush, but there would definitely be some mold going on. So the, the salt um, keeps the mold at bay a little bit and it keeps, in this case, it's keeping the yeast out a little more so that we don't get beet wine like we had with the pineapple. Um, you know, it, it tips it in the bacterial direction, meaning sour, rather than the yeast direction, meaning alcohol. Um, if you make beet cross with too little salt and you don't do anything else to um, tip the balance, then it gets slimy and thick and it's not, it's not very good. Uh, having said that, uh, you can use a bacterial starter um, to tip the balance and if you do that, you can use less salt. Um, I personally don't have experience with using no salt. Um, I know people have done it. I think if you want to do that, you may need to use a bacterial starter from a little silver envelope. and. Um, from a health point of view, I, I, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a mixed bag. So if the zombie apocalypse comes, we aren't going to have any more little silver envelopes. And so sort of philosophically, I prefer to do it without any, any technology, uh, any high technology as such. Um, but if you have a health crisis and you need to make beet cross and you really can't have a lot of extra sodium, then, you know, by all means, try it out. Um, um, you can use other things for starters for beet cross. I've heard of people using sauerkraut juice as a starter for beet cross. I mean, my concern there is that like over the course of a fermentation, like when you make sauerkraut, like for the first few days, there's one group of microbes. And then after that, there's a different group. And after that, there's a different group. And they all settle in depending on how long it's been fermenting, how acidic it is, what else is going on. So if you use a starter from a previous ferment or previous beet kvass, it may not have the best balance of microbes in it to act as a starter. However, it uh, could be enough or it could make things acidic enough that you're not going to have the 
the yeast in the mold problem, which is really what that's the purpose. What are the purposes for the salt? Um, and so like you need to do something to keep the yeast in the mold at bay. Salt works well. I, th I think most people are on the whole afraid of salt more than they need to be. I think there are also some people who obviously have specific problems with, with too much sodium. If you know, your kidneys aren't working right or, or you have, you know, particular disorder, but you know, not, not too long ago, there was a story in the New York Times that sort of went by quietly that said, oh, well, you know, salt isn't as much of a problem as we thought it was. So I, I don't want to oversimplify anything and say this is okay or this is not okay, but um, we may have been overly afraid of salt for a while. So what I'll say about salt is that I have a video that uh, salt is not health food, is my opinion, right? And so we should be just indiscriminately adding it to all kinds of things, you know, at the same respect, sodium is a required nutrient for us. So you need to get enough or it's not gonna be a good thing, right? I prefer to get that from my foods, not go above like maybe 1,000, 1,500 milligrams at most, um, you know, in a day. And where you get that is up to you. If you wanna get some of that from some salt, you know, in some kvass, you know, which I feel fine with, like a small amount, Right? This does not make up the majority of my diet, but the majority of my diet is fresh fruits and vegetables with some kvass, with some sauerkrauts made with a little bit of salt in there to add to, to get me up to my sodium requirement every day. That's great. You know, I've met people that shun all salt and then they become sodium deficient. So once again, life and a lot of things is not like too, is not about too much or too little. It's having just the right amount and get right, just the amount of sodium. Unfortunately, I think in our society, in this day and age, sodium is something and salt is something that is drastically overeaten and causing tremendous amount of health challenges these days. That being said, we shouldn't be entirely scared of it, but we should be aware of how much we're eating and actually be really realistic and more importantly, honest with yourself. You know, if you're salting all your food, that's probably not a good thing. If you're having beet kvass once a day and some sauerkraut once a day, you know, with a little sodium, that's probably not the end of the world, but also be aware of the other things you're eating so that you don't get too much sodium or any other nutrient in your diet. That'd be my opinion. So we got this weird thing here. Is this like a little wormy wormy? <laughs> what is this? So this thing? is a lactobacillus microbe. It's from, uh, I got it on the internet from giantmicrobes.com. I'm not an investor and owner of that. I'm <laughs> just a happy customer. And so this, if you look under a microscope or if you look up lactobacillus on the internet, this is actually what they look like. And these, you know, they do have dots. They're not actually eyes. It's not actually, you know, a, 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 you know, it's a microbe. It's a single cell organism. But, but um, I like to carry it around uh, to fermentation demonstrations, just, well, you know, it's cute and kids like it and... Um, Looks like a dog toy, man. Your dog would tear that up in two seconds. Yeah, no, I keep it away from your dog. It's <laughs> that's, a, that's a, what, $20 dog toy? Yeah, right. I think it's less than that, but... <laughs> and it, so why are lactobacillus, you know, this microbe, so good for us? So um, this is a microbe that makes beets into beet kvass. I mean, again, it's an oversimplification right. there. It's one of the main microbes. That yeah, make it happen. Indeed, and so and so, um, these this is you know one of the leaders of the the league of good microbes that that are going to help us digest things and get the nutrition we need. And um, so, so, I just like to bring it to get people <laughs> thinking about microbes. Um, cool. So we just saw two drinks, but you got maybe a few more. So what's the next one you want to introduce me to today? Well, so we have kombucha and it looks like, you know, a lot of you have probably seen this bottle before. This is from GT's, which is uh, one of the first and certainly the biggest com commercial kombucha manufacturer in the world. I think, um, you know, several hundred million a year they do okay. in kombucha. Um, I think the global kombucha market is on track to be what... It was like one or two billion this year. It's it, it's around there, but it's it's only I think beer is like five hundred billion a year or something. So it's still it's still a baby. But um, but so I reuse these bottles because they're very durable bottles. They they can handle pressure. The caps, you know, I keep yeah, using them. They hold pressure, <laughs> right? Like it's 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 ready to go. So um, so I'm gonna open this and I'm gonna clear the decks a little. I have a towel here. 
um, it, it could be exciting. So you, you made this kombucha yourself and it's really right. easy to make, you know, and one of the things that we both agree with is that we want you guys to be producers instead of consumers. If you go to the store with your $2 or $5 or however much the kombucha sells near you with the money that you got paid for working your job, right, you're consuming things, you're buying things that are pre-made. You don't really know and can you really trust GT's GT Dave and what he put in there, what did he add in there, how did he make it? All, do you trust the you know nutrition facts on the label, which every time they're always the same, they never change, and I really kind of wonder about that. And is there really just, uh, what do they say, four grams of sugar? Sometimes these things are pretty damn sweet to me, and it seems like it's more than four grams of sugar, right? And so like, I don't want you guys to do that. Like, if you guys want to drink kombucha, hey, I like to enjoy kombucha once in a while, right? Make your own, that's the best way to do it to assure you're gonna have the highest quality kombucha. Um, right, yeah. I mean, I will say that in the, in, the, in the realm of food producers, I trust GT Dave a lot more than I trust almost anyone else. But <laughs> still, he's making it and you pay $4 for it and you can make it for about 30 cents. 30 and, cents, wow, and 10, you'll save 10 times as much money. And you will know exactly what went in it. And if you have a garden, you can put your own, yeah, I put some, I get, um, you know, frozen strawberries at the store and I put them in there. Uh, you can grow your own strawberries, it's even better. If I had a garden, if I didn't live in a big cement apartment building, I would <laughs> be growing so much stuff. But that's, that's what I'm doing right now in my life. But, um, so I'm gonna open this and then it's gonna probably- so what's the secret to opening kombucha right. that's gonna explode, right? I wanna know. Right. <laughs> okay, keep it cold, first of all. So this has been sitting in a warm. So, so the way I made it is, and there's a date on there, which is August 4th, uh, sorry, 14th. So that means I, um, I bottled it August 14th, and then I probably left it out on the counter until like a couple of days ago. Um, and so I bottle it along with a couple of strawberries, and so it has a secondary fermentation oh, so like in the bottle. So like frozen strawberries, you just throw them in our hole. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and some ginger, I think, or turmeric, one or the other. Um, so that's what I usually that's do. The second ferment to really get it carbonated, like right. it's gonna be. Right, like it's gonna be. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm, I'm even gonna use the towel, I'm gonna have the towel ready in case it's a real gusher. Um, <laughs> Right, so there's some theater, right? Um, That's a good kombucha. It's, it's, now, this is naturally carbonated, guys. Like, right. it's unfortunate that many kombuchas are being force carbonated, right? It's, it's, being, it's being carbonated against its will to <laughs> add additional carbonation because people like it, right? So I only like to drink a, you know, a naturally carbonated kombucha. It's your help. <laughs> Mm. Man, that's amazing kombucha. Like a lot of kombuchas you'll buy, it's like actually too bubbly. Yeah. This is just like spot on. Thank you. The flavors are amazing. Oh, and because like I swear, like if you buy a GT's kombucha with the strawberries, they're not putting whole frozen strawberries in there to basically digest. They're using like strawberry puree that's already been heat processed. Mm. This is totally amazing. I, I really get the strawberry essence like yeah. more than any, like the ones that I've had from GT's in the past like taste like, kind of like artificial. This tastes mm. like actually real. Thank you. It's amazing. I, so what's in this kombucha you made? Um, so I use organic black tea, organic green tea, um, natural um, unbleached, like the sort of brownish sugar. Um, and that's what's in the tank brewing. And then, you know, the SCOBY on top. And by the time it's done brewing, you know, most of the sugar is, is brewed out. Um, and then I put it in the jar. I don't, I'm not sure this one actually had ginger in it. I didn't get any ginger, but I got, that you know. That strawberry for sure. Yeah, the strawberry. Good. And so I'll do, you know, frozen berries or uh, turmeric, ginger. You know, I rotate through like, I, you know, I was putting apple juice for a while, like cayenne, lemon juice. You can put, you know, any juice in there, any fruit, um, anything you want. You could put vegetables in there. You can put vegetable juices in there. Vegetable yeah. juices for sure. Superfood powder, spirulina, chlorella powder. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I keep things pretty simple and I'm, I'm you know, uh, the laziness and efficiency are two sides of the same coin and uh 
I like to you know do things pretty quickly and so I'll, I'll do things the same way for a while just to get into a routine then I'll get tired of it and then I'll do something else but I try to keep it very efficient so you know so, cool. and so it, in your book here you know it, it specifically goes into how to make some of the best kombucha you've ever tasted right well thank you <laughs> I you know uh, yes yeah it talks about I do a continuous brew with a big tank with a spigot at the bottom and um, you know, it's a little less pouring around of sticky big tanks of liquid that way. Um, so the question I have on a continuous brew is, are you getting the sugar content low if you're always keeping it going? Because you, you got to keep it to a certain level to keep the scoby happy, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, I'm doing it's like a semi-continuous, I guess. I mean, I let it go for a week. I, every week I take a third of it out and bottle it. Oh, I see. So it's not like I'm putting some in and then drinking some the next day. I see. Because you're just uh, going, you're bottling it, and then you're letting it ferment more to get some more of that sugar out. Right, and then it ferments in the bottle too. By so, saying, got it. you know, by the time it's done, again, like, I don't worry too much about how, sh how much sugar it has in it, but, um, and I'm, I'm pretty active, so I, you know, whatever carbs I eat, I can, I can burn through them. I mean, the, the, I think, you know, sugar has, has impact on our metabolism. And then the other problem sugar has is it's empty calories and it's yeah. calories that we're consuming that don't have anything yeah. coming along with them that could. And so if there's a little bit of sugar in my kombucha, I don't feel too bad about it because there's so much good stuff in there along with it. And um, a lot of the minerals, like if you're using mineral rich uh, sweeteners in your uh, fermenting, you're getting all the minerals with even less of the sugar. So it's 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 a good way to get some minerals. Um, although we were talking about this before, you have other ideas. There are lots of ways, lots of good ways lots to get minerals. minerals. You can get them from your food if your soil has any minerals in it. But, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, we get lots of things, lots of different ways, and there's no, there's no single one answer to how to. Of course, and you know. once again, you know, I'd rather have some of you drink, hopefully a home-brewed kombucha than kind of some kind of, you know, soda. You know, it's still way better. I'd rather have some of you drink one of these instead of like some kind of like processed, you know, concentrated orange juice, right? Right. Because it's, it, it's, there's more phytonutrients in here, you know, from the tea and from the other, you know, uh, ginger and turmeric or strawberries that are in there and all the acids and all the, basically the, the things that the bacteria and the scoby have created. So you want to maybe talk a little bit about, about that? Yeah. I mean, the, there, there are a lot of um, things in kombucha and nobody's quite analyzed all of them and maybe we never will you know every time we think we understand nutrition and food completely then like something else happens and it turns out that we were you know a little or a lot wrong um i do know that kombucha has traditionally had uh healing properties for a lot of people and like i said like i could name 10 people i know pretty well who have had acid reflux and had it fixed by their kombucha, so it rebalances your digestion. Um, you know, there there are some weird organic acids in kombucha that don't seem to exist in a lot of other foods that may have anti-cancer properties. I don't like making categorical statements about kombucha will save your life, but uh, it uh, it might. I don't know. It's, and you know that's the other thing that I want to impart on you after watching this video is you know it's I don't want you guys just drinking kombucha all the time I don't want you guys to drink the kombucha you know the kvass <laughs> the pineapple stuff I want you guys to make all the different ferments in here because each one has their own pros and cons to them their you know their benefits right and I think you know by basically eating a wider variety of foods and you know getting some nutrients that you might not be getting because if you don't normally drink tea right or drink matcha tea powder like I put in my smoothies you know, you're going to get some of the nutrients from the tea in the kombucha because that's pretty much what it's made out of. And once again, if you're buying kombucha in uh, bottles at the store, right, you're buying pretty much mostly water. So that you're, you're paying for the shipment of water literally around the country. I don't know if GT produces in local areas or they just produce it in L.A. and then it gets shipped all over. But think about all that shipping just so that you guys could drink the, the you know, the kombucha. And they're basically shipping water and like shipping water in, in water bottles and plastic jugs and bottles. I know you guys don't agree with that, but now we're doing the same thing with kombucha, but it's in a glass bottle, right? It, it's just really an inefficient use of the Earth's resources. When you could simply 
make it at home. And you know, that's why I like Alex's book here because he makes it easy for you guys to do that. <laughs> so Alex, what's the last drink that you actually brought today to, to share uh, with people and, and with me? <laughs> okay, so this one is something called Switchel and it's a traditional American drink. Um, but uh, going back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the show, it falls into a category of um, sort of drinking vinegars, like what they might have had in, in ancient Greece or Rome. Um, in our book, we have a, a section on five-minute fermented beverages, like fermented beverages you can make in five minutes if you don't have time to do anything complicated. Wow. And so it's a little tricky because, like, you know, there aren't a lot of things you can actually ferment in five minutes, but um, you can make some things based on fermented drinks and foods in five minutes. And so the base for this is a raw apple cider vinegar, which mm. I'm sure uh, you all are familiar with. And it's a great fermented food, but on its own, it's a little hard to drink. Um, and so this drink is called Switchel. It would be a traditional um, North American uh, drink from, you know, colonial era, I suppose, and, and up until sodas, took over everything. And so it's raw apple cider vinegar. There's a sweetener in here, which is molasses. And then this is a, a concentrated base. We're gonna put some in our cups and then we're gonna add some um, sparkling water to make something. Oh, there's some ginger in here too. So we're gonna make raw ginger. Uh, we're gonna make something that sort of resembles a soda, but instead of phosphoric acid, which is carcinogenic, that's what's in Coca-Cola, we have raw apple cider vinegar, which is a healthy acid. Instead of high fructose corn syrup, which is bad for you, and it has all sorts of trace solvents left over and from, you know, and it's GMO, and like, uh, we have, you know, a, a very mineral rich sweetener, which is organic molasses. And then we have the ginger, and then uh, we have the carbonation. So this is better than, better than soda. It beats soda on, on every count, and you can also make it sweeter or less sweet if you want, and by default it's, I don't, let me do the math, it's maybe, I don't know, a quarter or a sixth as much sugar as soda, so if you drink, you know, I, but you can, you can do it however you want. So I'm, I'm gonna guess uh, that this will be about right, um, and I'm gonna top it off. Maybe I'll taste mine first so that I can make sure John gets the perfect finished product. <laughs> So once again, like, you know, if you guys are still drinking soda, which I hope you guys, if you guys have been watching me for any length of time, you guys are off the soda stuff, but this is probably like, or how about your boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, girlfriend or husband or wife, right? Or kids. Hey, kids, yeah, get them on this stuff instead of the soda. Hey, it looks brown just like the soda stuff, right? Let's see how it tastes though. <laughs> right, sorry, I kind of been tasting, so. Yeah, so, I mean, it definitely doesn't taste like soda. It tastes more healthy. <laughs> yeah, right. I like the carbonation in there. I kind of taste, uh, I taste, I kind of, I mean, it tastes like what it is. It tastes like, I taste vinegar, but very mild vinegar. I don't taste any hardcore vinegar. I taste some of that hardcore molasses, you know, that I haven't had for many years since I don't really regularly eat molasses. But you know, frankly, molasses is probably one of the best sweeteners you guys could use because it actually really high in mineral content. Talking about minerals, you know? Yeah, yeah. The iron content, I think, in molasses is like off the chart. So if you're like deficient in iron, man, like the molasses is one of the best things probably. Yeah, no, I mean, like you said, I think this is a great like transition drink for getting people off of the processed soda and like to something more natural and, um, yeah, if you have five minutes and you want something, a fermented drink, this is, you know, it's a good way to go, I think. And then even beyond that, like beyond the switch, there's something like fire cider in your book as well, or? Fire cider being Another hard fire. apple cider? No, no, fire cider meaning basically you take a bunch of different herbs like turmeric and ginger and you basically just soak those in mm. apple cider mm. vinegar mm. and then you, and then you uh, take it out and then you add honey and then you could drink it. Yeah, yeah, we don't have that in the book, but, um, because most of our focus is on the actual fermenting. And so, you know, we throw in the, the apple cider vinegar based drink just as a sort of, you know, bonus. But um, we have a recipe for hard apple, for sorry, apple cider vinegar in there too. Oh, I see. So. Um, to make your own apple cider vinegar. 
Make your own apple well, cider vinegar. So you vinegar. can make your own apple cider vinegar and then make this drink with the apple exactly. cider vinegar. Exactly. So if you guys are buying your apple cider vinegar, make sure you get one that says uh, raw, unpasteurized, with the mother. Unfiltered, and, yeah. Yeah, and unfiltered. And make sure when you look at it, like there's been some like scams in the health food industry lately, mm. and I've seen some apple cider vinegars that say with the mother, and they're like almost clear. And I'm like, man, that's a scam. So you want to try to get like mm. a good brand. I mean, Bragg's is a good brand. They're just kind of expensive. But there's other brands that may be, uh, you know, good as well. But make sure like nice, rich, cloudy, and, and deep. You know, I got a really cool uh, raw apple cider vinegar actually at my local farmer's market. It actually has a mother floating in yeah, there. Yeah. It's like the real mother. And that's what you're going to get when you make your own. And how hard is that? It's pretty easy. I mean, so first of all, if you have your own apples, you've probably already figured out that you need to do something with them. And, and making cider is, is, is an obvious thing. And making... Hard apple cider comes after that, and then like if you screw that up, then you wind up with <laughs> apple cider vinegar anyway. But you can also make it, you can buy a gallon jug of apple juice at the store, organic, and pasteurized, then- Pasteurized, pasteurized apple juice. Yeah, and you can still make that into uh, vinegar. Oh wow. You know? And it's pretty easy, there's a recipe in there. Yeah, I would prefer to take my apples, and I would juice them all, make apple juice, and then I'd take my apple juice that's fresh and raw, and then turn that into that apple cider vinegar. That's better, yeah, that's better. <laughs> Especially if you have an apple tree, or even if you don't. But then like, you know, good, better, best. Of so. course, yeah, that's what I like to, you know, share with you guys. And that's why I had Alex on the show today to show you guys some alternatives, drinking some of the crappy stuff, some ways to make your, uh, you know, even your own kombucha to save you guys money, and also to drink a wide variety of new beverages that you may not be including. So you guys could, you know, once again, take one step in the right direction. Uh, towards better health. So I think my time with Alex is coming to an end today, but Alex, before we go, um, give me final comments or things you'd like to share with my viewers today. Yeah, um, don't overthink things. Don't uh, be hard on yourselves. You know, make your own food, get your hands dirty. Um, you are the best expert on your own health. Um, you know, use other people as resources, but don't don't get too hung up on, on things they say. And like, get to know how you feel. Spend some time understanding how you feel when you have, you know, certain kinds of foods or do certain kinds of things. Because that way you can gauge like what works for you and what doesn't. What might work for one person might not work for you. So, you know, we're all on the same team trying to, work this out we've become so um, alienated from our own bodies by the industrial culture we live in we're trying to find our way back and we're all helping each other do that and so that's my offer to you is I want to help you and you know so take from the book what's useful to you um, leave the rest behind um, you know share the recipes in there with or without credit you know, the people have been using the same recipes for thousands of years. It's like, you know, intellectual property is not like, it's not like you're copying. I, you know, I, we're, we're, all, we're all working towards the same goal. I, I would much rather you copy all this, don't tell my publisher, and, uh, <laughs> and make people healthy than, than not, you know. So, um, yeah, be, be the, the healthiest and happiest human that you can be and... and Let's, let's try and uh, fix, fix the things that are broken. And, and we start with ourselves, because if, if, if we're in personal crisis, then we're not gonna be able to reach out and help other people and, and fix some of the other things that are broken, so. Yeah, I totally agree. You know, much like I want you guys to become your own producer instead of a consumer, right? I also believe in more of an open source kind of world that we would live in where, you know, recipes are freely given instead of GTs have their trade secrets and they don't tell you how they do anything. Of course, you know, I mean, it's pretty common knowledge on how to make kombucha. Maybe not exactly the same as they're doing, but that's all right. Cause you're going to end up with maybe even in some cases a better product cause they have to do certain things because of the government. But that's a whole nother topic. But yeah, so I'm so glad I got to have Alex on the show today. So Alex, if somebody wants to buy your amazing book that I've actually <laughs> leafed through with over 30 different recipes so you guys can make all kinds of different fermented amazing beverages and the cool thing about Alex is you know he is like a math like major and geek and all this kind of stuff he goes into some of the science of like you know 
of uh, the fermentation and all the different chemical reactions and all this stuff. So I'm kind of like looking forward to reading some of this myself, but how can somebody buy uh, your book? Right, so the best way to buy it is go to your local bookseller and you know, buy it from them. And if they don't have it, say, hey, there's this awesome book. You know, can you get a couple of them? And I promise I'll buy one and, you know, get my friends to buy another. So that's the best thing, because after the zombie apocalypse, there's not going to be any Amazon. You're going to have the local bookseller and that's it if you're lucky. And and if you don't buy books from them, then you won't have them either. Having said that, if that doesn't work for you or if you're incredibly impatient, um, you can buy it online at Amazon. You can go to my website, um, I, various websites. So the website for our book, uh, for uh, the book of me and my co-author Raquel, who's also amazing and hopefully we'll get a chance to hear from her at some point. Um, so kombucha kefir and beyond dot com. It's kind of a mouthful. Um, my personal blog is called feed me like you mean it dot com. Um, there are links to the book all over there or just go on Amazon. And I'll put links down below so you guys could, uh, you know, purchase this really simply and easily. So yeah, that's pretty much it. And you, you give in your uh, contact information. I'll put his links down below as well. So you can check out his blog, check out the website for the book. And I uh, hope you guys learned a little bit in this episode about fermented beverages and how, to, how you guys could easily make some yourselves. I want you guys to do this seriously. I mean, just take in the beets and put them in water with a little salt. You know, you have an instant amazing beverage. I, or actually, I think the one I like the most today was the kvass. Like this one, uh, I don't really agree with me. The, the pineapple one was interesting, but this one, like really, I was like, wow, that's like, um, oh, I, well, I did like the kombucha. <laughs> but this one was really, the, I liked it the best because it's just, just for reals, getting some really good nutrients from the beets as well as the probiotics, which we really didn't even get into, but probiotics are so essential for our health. and. You know, I definitely think by making your own ferments like this is way better than taking white probiotic supplement powder that, you know, they've made in a little laboratory and cultured, right? But once again, good, better, best. I know those white powders and all these things from the health food store could help some people sometimes in certain conditions, but you got to kind of wonder like the viability of the little white probiotic powder, if they're still even alive. This way, if you do it yourself, you know they're alive, right? So anyways, if you guys enjoyed this episode with Alex today, please be sure to give me a thumbs up. If I get a lot of thumbs up, I'll come back and do some more episodes with him, maybe even some demos on how to make some of this stuff. I've definitely had a fun time sharing with you guys today and hope you guys found this was valuable as well. Also be sure to click that subscribe button right down below so you don't miss out on any of my new and upcoming episodes that have come out about every five to seven days. You never know where I'll show up or what you'll be learning on my YouTube channel. And finally, be sure to check my past episodes. My past episodes are a wealth of knowledge, over 450 videos on this YouTube channel dedicated to teach you guys all the different ways and why you should be eating more fresh fruits and fresh vegetables. So uh, with that, my name is John Kohler with OKRaw.com. We'll see you next time. And until then, remember, keep eating your fresh fruits and vegetables and fermented ones. They're always the best.